We're going to get started. I want to welcome everyone to the APS uh, Topical Group on the Physics of Climate seminar series. Uh, this is a seminar series that began almost a year ago today. And for those interested, the other excellent seminars that have been that have taken place in this series can be found on the web link that I posted in the webinar chat. The goal is to provide an overview of the physics of climate for the APS community. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Morgan O'Neill, who is a professor of Earth System Science at Stanford University. Morgan received her PhD from MIT in 2015, and her research focuses on the physics of, 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 of storms, as she'll talk about hurricanes and other severe phenomena. So this is a very exciting area of research, and I'm very much looking forward to her presentation. Just for the attendees' awareness, I will be monitoring the chat, and if there are questions that are toward a clarification, I will um, have give Morgan the opportunity to, to clarify so we can all be on the same page. But um, for the more um, specific questions that are not clarification, we will have uh, time at the end to discuss those uh, as a group. So with no further ado, I would uh, like to have Morgan take over and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, and thanks to the APS GPC uh, seminar committee for inviting me. I was meant to give this talk about a year ago, but family things uh, interrupted. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to reschedule. So thanks for that. All right, I will share my screen. So this is a very broad um, overview. And so many of you are going to find a lot of the topics broached uh, very incomplete or just examples of different types of physics. Um, I might move kind of quickly through them, but I'm really uh, receptive to, to emails uh, or questions at the end about the details of these sorts of things. This is a really fascinating but huge topic. And so I'm just going to try to give you a, a flavor of a bunch of different um, examples and mechanisms that uh, climate scientists are interested in. This uh, photo was taken by Tomer Berg of, it was one of the storms in a severe outbreak um, last year in April, I think that was one of the billion dollar disasters in the US. Um, and so here we see uh, uh, the mesocyclone of a, a supercell thunderstorm. Um, and I believe this may itself have dropped a tornado. All right, so oops, how do I? Okay, great. Um, so the, the climate system or the climate can be conceptualized as a heat engine. And uh, it is not like a, a regular heat engine. It, is, it has some unique characteristics. For example, unlike the Carnot heat engine that we learn about in, in introductory thermodynamics class, the heat input or Q in to the system from the hot reservoir, which is the surface, actually equals Q out. And so when you're thinking of the classic Carnot heat engine, um, you'll immediately be confronted with the fact that such an engine can do no work. There is no ability for the climate system to export useful work to you know, lift a weight beyond the earth, whatever, uh, whatever silly example you want to conceptualize. Uh, but we can, in fact, define mechanical efficiency which has been done by a number of authors. And, and we reviewed this pretty exhaustively in a, a recent review I wrote with Marty Singh at Monash. Um, the climate system actually does a lot of work on itself. And so all of the winds, all of the kinetic energy, all of the ability to, to lift uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, that all comes from the production of kinetic energy, which is ultimately dissipated to friction. Uh, and so this Q in equaling Q out is not a problem. Um, and in fact, the Carnot efficiency is not an upper bound on the efficiency of your heat engine if you're only doing work in the system itself. Um, and this efficiency is uh, in part a function of the difference between T in, this hot reservoir kind of land and sea surface temperature, and our cold upper atmosphere, T out. And as those temperatures diverge, you can expect potentially a more efficient uh, heat engine. However, the big complication and, and the thing that makes the Earth's climate so remarkable and exciting, and this is actually why so many planetary climates in our, our uh, solar system are so interesting, 
is that we have a phase change. We have water undergoing all three phases in the atmosphere. And so simply increasing the temperature difference between your hot reservoir and your cold reservoir does not immediately suggest that you're going to have a more efficient heat engine. So all of the interesting stuff, in my opinion, in the atmosphere is because of this uh, phase change of water vapor, um, and in particular, in a subsaturated atmosphere. This climate heat engine is changing. So some of this is Nobel Prize worthy work, which I know other um, speakers in the seminar series have covered in the past, but we know that the troposphere is warming and much more recently we know it's expanding. Those things are consistent with each other. And we also know that the stratosphere is cooling and contracting. And so this impacts T out just as it impacts T in. And so this climate heat engine is kind of a, a moving target. Um, and Tiffany, I see that I just got a little blurb that said my internet connection is unstable, which shouldn't be an issue, but if it is, please put something in the chat so I see it even with low bandwidth. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, so this is a, a cloud-free picture of the earth and you can kind of get a sense of what weather systems are doing. Um, the, the equator is, is right here. Uh, if you can see my, Tiffany, can you see my mouse? Okay. Yes. Okay, super. So the equator is right along here and we can see that in the subtropics, we have these dry, um, you know, desert dominated bands, although there's tons of longitudinal, longitudinal heterogeneity. Um, and then in the deep tropics, we have the, the Amazon and these, these really rich, lush regions. And that's because of the role of storms. I'll use storms kind of loosely in this talk. A storm is not a technical term. It, to me, it is an ex, it is, you know, some scale of organized deep convection that is expressed in, among other things, uh, very strong updrafts and and rain and potentially hail. And that can be part of a rotating system or not. Uh, but I just want to draw your attention to the really different range of scales in this uh, beautiful picture of clouds here, where in the tropics, we tend to have smaller scale systems. We have clusters of deep convection. Sometimes they're quite large, actually. We know the monsoons are, are tropical phenomena. And then in the mid latitudes, we have these much larger uh, organized extra tropical storms where you can see these, these very long bands of organized um, convection uh, advecting over you know, a thousand or more kilometers. And so it is this multi-scale problem, which again, you you know, for those of you watching all of the talks in the series, um, you've learned a lot about that uh, makes the climate so interesting. And so my particular focus, the, the thing that I'm most interested in is these discrete organized events that people feel and respond to. I'm really interested in how climate is expressed to an individual living in a place. And that usually looks like the extreme events that they, um, that they experience and have to respond to and those that disrupt lives. So I mentioned that moisture radically changes convection in the atmosphere. Uh, for our review paper, <clears throat> Marty ran two different, two different simulations, one without water vapor in the atmosphere and one with. And so the one without, you can see these updrafts uh, expressed by the colors and vertical velocity where updrafts are a deep blue and downdrafts are uh, a bright yellow. And on the left, you can see that those are pretty symmetric over a, a sea surface of constant temperature. And this is just in a little oceanic box. It's highly idealized. There's no wind shear here. There's no, you know, reasonable like uh, latitude. There's no rotation. As soon as you allow water vapor, to evaporate from the surface and participate in the circulation of this little numerical experiment, you get all of a sudden very, very strong and highly localized updrafts, and they can be seen in the visible uh, as clouds. And so here we've just outlined, you know, the, the regions that you would likely see uh, visually as clouds. And so all of a sudden we have few concentrated updrafts, um, certainly creating lots of rain, and then most of the region around is very, very slow, clear sky subsidence. And that is a lot like what we see in the real tropics where we have you know, these discrete um, clusters of deep convection. So there are many different types of storms. Again, this is not a technical term. So I've just listed 
some of them, and I'm probably missing some, but um, hurricanes are top of mind uh, starting at, you know, at this point in the summer and, and moving forward uh, through the mid fall. Um, the technical term is a tropical cyclone in different basins in the world. They're called cyclones or typhoons. Um, here in the States, we call them hurricanes. Uh, regular thunderstorms, which I find very boring only because I study, you know, supercell thunderstorms. Um, but, you know, a boring old thunderstorm can, you know, induce lightning that starts wildfires. It can have downbursts that can be, you know, devastating to small airports. There's, you know, there's a lot of interest, even in a typical thunderstorm that doesn't have much uh, rotational character. Supercells can drop tornadoes. Uh, so those are obviously really consequential. They also can live longer because they're exhaust air, which in a normal thunderstorm cuts off your energy source. It cuts off the, the moist supply of boundary layer air. Um, it, it's actually dumped kind of outside the storm or, or to the side of the storm. And so there's always this kind of fresh influx of very unstable, moist boundary layer air. And so you can get tornadoes um, you know, that, that or, or tornado outbreaks or clusters that can last for hours. So these are particularly devastating. And we'll talk a little bit about where we find those in the States later. There are atmospheric rivers. Here's a nice example of uh, the total precipitable water in the atmosphere. Um, you can see in this, this picture uh, up above, you can see an atmospheric river. This, this has had many names in the past. This is not a, a new phenomenon. This is a very, very old phenomenon. I think it's also uh, for this region called the Pineapple Express. Um, and so you can see this uh, moist belt uh, impinging on California where it immediately encounters uh, uh, mountain ranges and that air lifts and, and rains an extraordinary amount. And that's something we experienced um, a great deal this past winter in California. It, it has been very, very, very wet um, and in a devastating way, actually, even though it lifted us in most parts out of the drought. There are extra tropical cyclones. You probably see the news in the winter, depending on where you live. These really dramatic um, headline leading terms like bombogenesis and snowpocalypse. These are just the giant low pressure systems that, that occur in the colder months um, and, and you know are responsible really for the, the bulk of the um, energy transfer in the mid latitudes to get that warm equator uh, you know, moisture laden uh, equatorial air up to the poles and to bring cold air masses down to the tropics. There are derechos. This image is a composite. I want to be clear that this radar image was not taken as a snapshot. You can see the timestamps here, 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m. This is a composite radar image of this derecho storm progressing from the west to the east and kind of developing. And this can be a very, very damaging type of storm. It's definitely not um, a supercell thunderstorm. It, it, it is primarily uh, bringing straight line winds, but they can also be devastating. And this has been, this type of storm has been responsible for uh, really massive and, and uh, widespread power outages. And then if we were to extend the definition of a storm even farther, uh, something that is really uh, fascinating and, and frightening is what we call pyrocumulonimbus. And that is the thunderstorm that forms and builds in what is typically a stable atmosphere. And it's able to induce this huge uh, rapid updraft and create local weather because of the heat source at the surface, which is a wildfire. And so, you know, you can have a gorgeous blue sky day, um, a hot summer day, very stable, no clouds at all. And then if you all of a sudden, you know, turn on the uh, uh, the stove or you have a wildfire underneath, you can create you know, pyrocumulonimbus. And so um, those are really fascinating as well. And those have uh, chemical implications for the lower stratosphere. Um, and then finally, the, the last on my list here, which I'm sure is still quite abbreviated, is a dust storm or haboob, which is uh, very self-explanatory. These are winds that pick up dust and sand um, uh, over dry areas and, and, and move them uh, many miles, uh, sometimes at, at really high speeds. And so these you know, drop visibility. These can be really dangerous for, um, for driving and for air quality. And, 
Um, so this is the this is the rough list. I'm going to just focus on um, you know a, a short a brief overview of the physics of hurricanes and supercell thunderstorms. Uh, yes, I think that's it. And then we'll we'll actually look at some storms on other planets. You'll see a dust storm again. So yeah, I'm really interested in this link between weather and climate. So weather has historically been a very um, may, maybe trade oriented field where the goal uh, of many programs in the US and abroad is to understand the physics of weather so that we can make good forecasts so that we can save lives and protect property. And so it's really important that the educational system produced produce competent meteorologists who can improve our forecast models. Now, forecast models are a very, very different animal than climate models. Forecasting is an initial uh, condition problem where you really need to have a good idea of the present state of the atmosphere so that you can integrate the equations of motion forward um, to make a prediction uh, in the near future. Climate models are not solving that problem. They care about the boundary conditions, indeed the changing boundary conditions, but still boundary conditions. And they're not going to tell you about the weather in June 2052, but they will tell you about, you know, the bounds of the climate that will promote or make unlikely certain types of weather. So last year was a banner year for uh, billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And this of course is a very US centric slide, but we remember, remember the really dramatic uh, flooding and heat waves abroad in Asia and in Europe uh, and in Africa. And so, you know, this is just a taste of how significant weather events are. And so my argument, which is the least controversial thing that any climate scientist can say is that people experience climate in discrete events. You know, when people uh, immigrate or um, I get, immigrate is not even the word I want. When there are refugee crises leaving one region and moving to another, often that's exacerbated by, um, you know, you could say climate in general, but actually it's really like a local drought or, you know, a series of heat waves or crop failures um, that make people move. And so climate for many people is felt by uh, experiencing extremes. And so, you know, Florida is not going to experience just a very, very slow rise in sea level um, that will make people move. Even That's happening anyways, but what's going to change the economy in Florida eventually, and maybe rather soon, is, you know, an increase in the extremes where you have king tides, you know, flooding coastal cities, um, and then, uh, the increasing uh, salinity of the water table. So these things are, these things can happen in bursts and that's actually why people leave. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about two different ways of looking at the climate and storm connection uh, with some examples of each. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how climate impacts storms. And this has gotten a fair amount of attention in the literature. We see climate as this large scale thing that is being, you know, secularly pushed by the CO2 uh, increase in the atmosphere, as well as other um, trace gases that are there uh, that have greenhouse warming potential. And these impact storms. And so a common way to study this problem is to, for example, look at the CMIP class of, of climate models, which have pretty coarse resolution, but they can run for a very long time. Uh, and then say, okay, 100 years from now, you know, what, what are the ingredients that we see in these coarsely resolved models that suggest that storms would be occurring if they were resolvable uh, in this climate? And that's a very one-way street where your climate is changing due to, you know, large-scale resolved mechanisms and forcings, but you're kind of assuming a lot about the passivity of storms as just kind of reflecting the climate that they occur in uh, without a feedback. And so later in the talk, we'll, we'll kind of invert this and we'll look at the arrow below and we'll ask how storms could potentially impact climate. And that's not something that our climate models are designed to do. That is still an extremely expensive problem, mostly because of resolution. Um, and people are working really hard on uh, you know, physics aware parameterizations to tackle this sort of issue because, you know, it might be for a while out of reach of, of direct 
uh, uh, numerical simulation. Okay. So how will hurricanes change under climate change? So there are a few things that we're really confident about. And one of them is not frequency. So I'll just talk about briefly the things that we feel really good about um, you know, as a community and, and sharing with the public, because these are just so simple, they would be almost impossible to get wrong. And the first one is sea level is rising. This is observable and it's, um, it's also, you know, clearly inevitable from a, you know, a global heating standpoint. And so as sea levels rise, if you have a storm that's moving along a, a higher uh, sea level, into your coast, it's going to be able to move more water further inland. And so that is going to increase storm surge. Storm surge is the water that a hurricane is able to push up and onto a coast and, and inland, inland. So storm surge is, is salty seawater. Um, and so it, also I wanna mention the main killer of that, that hurricanes bring when they make landfall is not wind. We measure wind, we talk about category one to five, you know, this is a wind metric, but the really deadly part of hurricanes is the, the flooding. And that comes from two different sources. And one is storm surge here, and we have confidence that that's going up. And the other is the clausius clapeyron relation, which Tiffany and others have mentioned in their, um, in their talks in this series. And that's just the fact that as lower tropospheric temperatures uh, rise as we experience global warming. Um, the saturation vapor pressure of water is going to go up by about 77% for each degree Celsius. Um, now this is a, a saturation vapor pressure, but we're kind of assuming that relative humidity is roughly fixed, maybe around 50% um, to make this argument. And that is something that we understand much less well, but that seems to be uh, pretty robust uh, across climate models. And so um, with those two pieces of evidence, this this very well established one, and then this this result that we get from a whole host of models, it's clear that the atmosphere is going to have much much more water vapor in it, and so that increases the rain component of storms, and and those are the two ways that hurricanes can induce flooding. Storm surge brings in salty seawater, rain brings in fresh um, fresh rainwater, and and both of those are increasing, and so we we robustly expect that. Uh, hurricanes are are getting wetter and are going to likely, you know, uh, have the potential for for much more flooding in the future. Other claims about hurricanes are more speculative, but there's a range of speculation. And, and again, we don't feel really strongly as a field about uh, frequency, um, but it only takes one in a year for a region to be devastated by a Category Five. Um, and so I want to mention this really nice. I have a few plots from this really nice review paper that came out last year, um, which I recommend as, as reading. And this, this paper studies the polar expansion of, you know, the, the global capacity to host tropical cyclones. Um, and so this has a number of metrics that suggest to us a likelihood of polar expansion of tropical cyclone tracks. So the first here is sea surface temperature. Um, these are just linear trends, linear observed trends. Um, and you, we can see that sea surface temperature is increasing uh, pretty substantially actually in the mid latitudes. And so that means that there's a broader region of the tropics. The tropics are effectively expanding um, because hurricanes need, you know, a, a very energetic sea surface uh, in order to draw energy and, and convert it into winds. Um, there's this metric called potential intensity, which Carrie Emanuel at MIT developed. Um, and we can see that that's increasing too. This is a measure of the thermodynamic, uh, you know, maximum wind speed that we would expect in specifically the eye wall of a hurricane. It does not tell us anything about the size or the longevity of a hurricane, but it tells us, okay, if we know this T in at the surface, if we know this hot reservoir temperature, we know the T out aloft. And if we know a few other things, for example, the um, you know, the, the relative humidity near the surface and other things that we combine into um, other parameters, we can measure a potential intensity, which is the peak wind speed that we would expect a strong storm to gain. And that's going up in much of the tropics and subtropics as well. Um, 
maybe I'll skip these others, but down here we have a Genesis, Genesis potential too. And that's kind of a, a summary, if you will, uh, of the many different ingredients that tropical cyclones need in order to, to exist. So, you know, low enough wind shear, uh, sufficient cyclonic vorticity, um, warm enough sea surface temperatures. Um, so all of the ingredients at once uh, inform these genesis potentials. And we can see that, oops, sorry, we can see that those are increasing, um, particularly away from the deep tropics. And then finally, we see this tropical cyclone outflow temperature. And this again is, is you know, much like the slides I showed in the beginning where we see for the climate system as a whole, um, you know, the, the warm surface temperature mattering, but also the temperature aloft mattering because that difference is partly what informs the potential intensity or what informs the ability for winds to be, you know, particularly strong. And we can see that that's decreasing. So this is this has gotten relatively less stud, um, attention, but it was, it was covered in this review, and we can see that uh, in the subtropics, that's actually going down. And it's going down right over the regions where potential intensity, and this is this is obviously not a coincidence, and sea surface temperature is going up. And so uh, along with this idea that the tropics are expanding, we can look to paleoclimate or climate in the deep past to see what that means for tropical cyclones. These are modern tracks, but if we look at the outcome of a simulation, um, that is able to resolve uh, tropical cyclone-like storms or can be seeded with uh, simple tropical cyclone um, models to understand where tracks would occur. This is what we see. We see, you know, a, a very global broad distribution of hurricanes um, in the Paleocene, Eocene. Notice that the continents look a little unfamiliar. That's because this is, um, this is in, um, this is a paleoclimate simulation, and so it's appropriate to, to um, give it continents that are consistent with that period as well as that temperature. So leaving hurricanes temporarily, um, uh, yeah, actually leaving hurricanes entirely. Uh, I also want to mention Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is undergoing kind of a dramatic and frightening shift right now. Uh, we can see here on the left, a measure of the um, of the uh, potential. I think this is a, a, a tornado potential index um, showing the historical change and shift in Tornado Alley from what we traditionally consider to be Tornado Alley, which is the Great Plains, um, toward the southeast, toward the uh, the more southern regions, and and you know even more into. Uh, even New England, um, where my family lives and where we got hit by a tornado once. Um, of course, there are there are all kinds of one-off events, but this is uh, this is actually increasing in likelihood. And so this is observations. But I want to draw your eye to this very robust um, and consistent outcome if we look at uh, climate models. So these two plots are looking at something called updraft helicity. Helicity is simply the vorticity or the rotation, the curl of the velocity field. And here we're talking about rotation kind of horizontally. So horizontal winds kind of spinning like so. Um, and then the updraft is the thing that carries those winds aloft. And so the product of that vorticity and the updraft gives us a helicity. Uh, and we're looking here at the difference between a climate change scenario um, consistent with the uh, representative concentration pathway 4.5. Uh, the IPC has created a series of um, potential CO2 concentration scenarios uh, that, that researchers have used to, to do dynamical downscaling, uh, minus the history. And so let me explain briefly the experiment that they ran to make these plots. They took current climatology and then they, um, they did dynamical downscaling where they have inputs at the sides of, of a a numerical model that covers the US. And then they ran weather, a weather model basically at very high resolution to get, you know, supercell like storms. Uh, and so they did that in the current climate. And then they went to the IPCC models and they got output from, you know, 60 or 80 years from now. And they did the same thing. They embedded a high resolution model into, um, 
into the inputs and outputs from this climate model, which has very poor resolution. And they ran this high resolution model again. And so again, they can get, you know, quasi resolved or at least supercell permitting storms. And so they can actually measure an updraft helicity. And for these two different representative concentration pathways, both 4.5, which is in the upper plot, and 8.5, we can see a very consistent story with the linear trend shown in this older paper to the left. And that is a shift of Tornado Alley from uh, the, the traditional Great Plains, you know, Dorothy's Kansas, um, toward the Southeast. Now, from a, a social perspective, this is super concerning because there are a couple aspects of tornadoes and supercells that are um, uh, different and worse in the Southeast. Physically, they tend to happen at night more, so they are uh, harder to see. They can happen in the middle of the night. That's that's less typical in the Great Plains. Um, and so people are often sleeping. Physically, they also tend to be more rain wrapped. So it's more difficult to see like a clear, you know, photogenic uh, funnel. So you know exactly where the tornado is. Um, and then socially, uh, the population over here is just much denser and people live in less secure housing. There's a lot more um, trailer home uh, distribution in these areas. And so a lot of people are living without basements, they're living without tornado shelters. And so they're much, much more vulnerable to these much more dangerous storms. And so we can expect to see an increase in fatalities and damage, even without a climate change signal, um, if there's this shift going on. But we can see that the shift, which has already started and is measurable in observations, is going to continue uh, to grow under these different representative scenarios that the IPCC has um, has designed. So that's a great concern. And it's another example of how weather and climate are really inseparable. These problems are, um, you know, we, we, we need meteorologists to talk to climate scientists and vice versa, because, you know, these extreme events are what are going to, you know, move communities to adapt or mitigate or, or <laughs> have people leave. And so this is, this is a really um, this is a really pressing problem, and it's it's difficult because computationally it's so very expensive. So let's talk about this. So we've talked about how climate can impact these storms. We see that sea surface temperatures are rising. You know the outflow temperature of hurricanes is is decreasing, and so we can see that climate is you know it's changing boundaries are going to change storms. Sea surface is rising, whatnot. But let's talk about the inverse. And this uh, will let me get a little bit into my own research um, as well as uh, other research. And we'll even uh, look at the outcome of the recent uh, gigantic volcano uh, eruption. So the first thing I want to mention, well, I guess in general, I'm going to focus on uh, water vapor and water vapor's role in the lower stratosphere as a, an interesting and important example of how the small scale and the large scale are inextricably linked. So here is a plot of the atmosphere and it distinguishes the troposphere, which is weakly stratified from the stratosphere, which is strongly stratified. Now, for those of you who are not atmospheric scientists, which I hope are many of you, um, let me briefly explain this really strange um, stratification. These are temperatures. If you see my mouse, this is 290 Kelvin. This is 305 Kelvin. What we're looking at is a temperature that has been scaled by the compressibility of the atmosphere. If you imagine a water glass with warm water above cold water, you know immediately that that's quite stable because the temperature in the top of the glass is warmer than in the bottom of the glass. In the atmosphere, it's not that easy because as gas rises adiabatically, it expands and cools um, you know, which does not make it unstable aloft. That's just um, what happens in a compressible fluid. And so what atmospheric scientists do is regularly scale uh, the, the temperature by the compressibility of the atmosphere. So we use this really convenient metric that is physically meaningful, even though it's not the temperature you would get if you put a thermometer outside the plane. Um, so it just indicates that the troposphere here in this dry temperature metric is weakly stratified and the stratosphere, hence its name, is strongly stratified. And so we can see that the tropics where it's very warm um, are very deep. That's the, the highest altitude of our troposphere where we live. And we can split this, the stratosphere into two different layers. 
we have the stratospheric middle world, and that encompasses the stratosphere uh, kind of bounded by the tropopause, the tropopause being this thick black line, this boundary um, in the mid latitudes and the potential temperature, that's the special scale temperature, um, that it, uh, the potential temperature surface that intersects with the tropopause right in the deep tropics. And so if you're in the stratospheric middle world, you can actually see that uh, that air has a similar temperature, whether it's within the tropics, uh, sorry, within the troposphere or in the latitudes within the stratosphere. And so the overworld is harder to get to, right? The overworld, if you're considering, for example, a storm in mid latitudes, the overworld is quite a bit into the stratosphere up here. And it's bounded by this 380 Kelvin surface, which in mid latitudes is quite into the stratosphere and it just skims the tropopause in the tropics. So stratospheric water vapor sources include direct mid latitude convection even though that's not the main source. So I'm quite interested in storms and we know that the bulk of the water vapor that gets into the stratosphere is coming from the deep tropics. But the deep tropics uh, aloft are very, very, very cold. And so very little water vapor makes it up here without kind of freeze drying into ice crystals and then falling out. So this is really kind of a bottleneck on the humidity of the stratosphere. But if you have an energetic enough storm, and this is where thunderstorms come in. This is where supercell thunderstorms come in, even extra tropical cyclones. If you have an energetic enough, tall enough storm, you can bypass this cold point here, which really restricts the humidity of the stratosphere. And you can dump water vapor directly into the warmer stratosphere at mid-latitudes. You can dump ice, actually. I think that's the primary mechanism. If you dump ice up here where it starts to get warmer, the ice is going to sublimate. And all of a sudden you have this substantial uh, water vapor source. When I say substantial, again, this is still, you know, an important secondary, but not primary source of water vapor. And so what I've been studying uh, lately is uh, these discrete mid-latitude events that are capable of this type of hydration, because this is a really clean link between, um, uh, that illustrates how storms can impact climate. Of course, there's still mostly a big question mark there, but this is something that we're working on. And the physics are really exciting at the small scale. So here you can see this satellite image on the right of a string of uh, deep supercell thunderstorms um, over the Great Plains. This may have been in 2021. I'm not sure when the satellite image was um, taken. Uh, and then to the left, you can see an example of um, these storms in both the visible and the infrared, where the colors indicate very cold cloud tops in purple and very like relatively warm cloud tops in yellow. And so, and this arrow indicates the environmental winds um, kind of pushing these storm anvils uh, to the upper right. So I wanna draw your attention to these warm plumes uh, right in the lee of these overshooting tops here where you see the thing streaming downstream is uh, is relatively warm. That physics is really interesting. And in recent work that we did um, in 2021 with my colleagues Lee Orff at Wisconsin, as well as Kelton Halbert at Wisconsin and Jerry Heimsfield at NASA Goddard, we studied uh, the small scale, highly resolved dynamics in a numer numerical model. And we think they look like this. We think that the tops of these storms that you see here in the satellite image um, when rendered in 3D in a really expensive numerical model, um, actually indicate a hydraulic jump and a really unique hydraulic jump, one that is forced not by, you know, topography or, or the, the sluice gate of a dam or, or the fact that, you know, a mountain is in the way of a, a horizontal stream of air, but actually the obstacle is the thunderstorm itself. The thunderstorm is in the way of these strong upper level winds. And uh, if those winds are strong enough, as Cameron Holmeyer showed uh, nicely, he's, he's at Oklahoma and has done a lot of terrific foundational work in this field. If those, thunder, if those thunderstorms um, you know, are robust enough and the winds are strong enough, then you can actually get this really nonlinear, gorgeous behavior right in the lee, where you get this kind of standing, crashing uh, gravity wave. And what it's doing is lofting ice into the lower stratosphere. And actually, not just in the middle world, but the overworld too. And that ice is sublimating and becoming water vapor. And so if we look at the middle world, 
Um, I will, I'm not mentioning the control here, so we can just look at the solid lines, uh, not the dashed lines. We had a control storm because everyone should always have a control. Um, but if we look at the onset of this hydraulic jump that we studied in this particular work, um, we can see that as soon as it started, the hydration rate of the lower stratosphere uh, jumped up to more than seven tons per second, which is really dramatic. And if you scale that up, it's roughly consistent with an estimate in the literature of potentially maybe as much as 15% of the water vapor in the stratosphere being due to uh, uh, direct convective hydration above these really extreme storms. And so there's a possibility of a feedback loop here where now you really need storms to be resolved and to be responsive to this kind of small scale, uh, you know, extreme nonlinear mechanism at the storm top in order to get a feedback that might actually push the climate. We know that the lower stratosphere cools directly um, and due to accelerated ozone destruction. So that's an, a direct and an indirect way for water vapor in the lower stratosphere to impact the climate. Um, more controversially, there's some possibility that the lower surface warms due to upper, uh, upper water vapor, although here, you know, I suggest you see these papers by Huang. I can send you the reference if you'd like. That's, this claim is less clear. Uh, specific humidity increases via clausius clapeyron That I mentioned before is super robust. Uh, and then the ingredients for energetic storms increase. And then potentially you get this kind of, um, you know, this binary event where you get, you know, you either do or don't have a hydraulic jump, which is this really strong hydrator. So that is an example of deep convection just doing its thing in an unstable atmosphere, but sometimes the forcing is geological and it can also have a really strong impact on the climate. And so this isn't really, you know, at first blush, a meteorological phenomenon, but if you recall the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haupai eruption uh, last year, there was this dramatic eruption um, in the Pacific that, that shot, I think at peak, it reached 58 kilometers. Uh, altitude, so, you know, well into the mesosphere, um, and potentially the ionosphere, I forget. But here we can see these snapshots uh, from space. And this dramatic event um, joined a family of pyro CB, if you can see in this time series here from this nice paper last year, um, where the x-axis is, um, is the year, and we're looking at different levels in the atmosphere of um, SO2 concentration, water concentration. Uh, we can see that this Hunga Tonga Hunga uh, event was really a dramatic record breaker, and in particular in water. But I like this plot so much because it also includes pyro CV events, which are due to wildfires. Wildfires, of course, are exacerbated by, you know, potentially increasing dry convection, um, you know, uh, uh, anthropogenic starters, which is not a climate issue, but if people are, you know, living at the wildland urban interface and, and causing fires accidentally, we can get more of those. And then climate change, just drying out our forest stocks. And so we can see that these pyro CBs are also pumping water vapor into the lower and mid stratosphere, um, as well as volcanoes. And so unlike the storm type I just showed you before, where you have a thunderstorm, which is responding to, you know, the meteorological instability in the atmosphere, we have these really different forcings, one geological and one uh, due to, to wildfires, dumping water vapor, which is really climatically important into the stratosphere. And I wanna just, I, I couldn't have rephrased this better. So I pulled this nice quote from this paper by Milan et al uh, last year about just how unique, just how special this particular volcanic uh, eruption was. It might be the first observed volcanic eruption that is going to impact climate, not through surface cooling, which is the, you know, the Pinatubo-like typical uh, mechanism that we, we associate with volcanic eruptions, but actually causing surface warming. And that's because the water vapor impact in the upper stratosphere, where things tend to have a longer residence time, is going to outlast the sulfate aerosol residence time. The sulfate aerosols being the things that cool the planet. So if you dump much more water vapor and it stays up there for longer, you can get a surface warming. So with my last couple minutes, I just wanna show uh, a few storms abroad 
um, on other planets because they're so exciting and water vapor is not the only um, uh, constituent of interest and relevance in making storms. I just want to help people um, listening to this talk appreciate just how ubiquitous storms are uh, in, in a dramatic variety of atmospheres and just how familiar they are. So here are the northern North Pole uh, polar vortices of Jupiter. These were discovered very recently um, and announced uh, and shown for the first time in this paper in 2018. There's a similar uh, infrared image for the South Pole, which I believe has five vortices around a center cyclone instead of this, um, this eight. But anyways, here we have this nice infrared image of these cyclonic uh, vortices uh, circling the pole. They kind of are locked in this crystalline configuration, which no one expected. You know, no science fiction writer had ever described such a, a, a polar uh, arrangement. So it's really dramatic and exciting. Over here on the right is a visual image of lightning occurring in one of these cyclones. So this little glow right here is a snapshot of, um, you know, light, a lightning bolt or a lightning complex. And the physics of how this is possible on Jupiter is likely to be very similar to that of Earth. On Earth, when we have really strong updrafts, we have um, uh, ice crystals passing, uh, kind of rubbing against um, liquid water, and then those are separating charges within a cloud, which eventually is um, uh, released in giant lightning bolts. And there is water vapor. There are There is a water cloud deck on Jupiter as well. Additionally, there's a, a, a mechanism with ammonia and ammonia kind of slush balls that's that's uh, newly uh, proposed that allows this lightning to be uh, to originate even higher in the atmosphere where liquid water is uh, impossible because it's too cold. Um, Saturn has periodic massive planet encircling storms. Here is a an example over two years of this uh, great northern storm that that kind of ate its tail as it progressed around the planet. And these are very aperiodic, uh, sorry, these are very unusual events. And that's because the giant planets are mostly hydrogen and helium. These are very, very light elements. Water, which is probably the primary constituent that allows this energetic storm to, to reach the, the visible surface is much heavier. It's H2O. It has that really heavy oxygen atom. And so it takes a long time for the upper atmosphere to cool such that the water deck at depth uh, is able to, um, you know, have updrafts that release latent heat and allow a storm to build. Um, uh, and this frequency was figured out actually by Cheng Li and really nice work. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. So you can look into Cheng Li's work um, to understand this. And then my last um, member of the, the storm zoo in the solar system is Martian dust storms. I hope, do I have a better slide? Yeah, sorry about that. So Mars sometimes can be fully encased by a global dust storm. Um, and these are, these are, you know, also very unusual. Sometimes they're regional dust storms, sometimes they are fully global. And this is an example of a storm actually not needing substantial water vapor or a phase change to, to have a lot of energy to kick up dust and loft it in the atmosphere. And in fact, really recent research suggests that these dust storms uh, strip water from the surface of the planet and actually loft it to the upper part of the atmosphere where it gets broken into um, you know, its hydrogen constituents and then lost to space because hydrogen's so light. And so that's that's very exciting too. It's one of the ways that Mars may have lost its, its oceans, these dust storms. So my last slide is just this really nice illustrative image made by NASA of this really glorious simulation that I've spent some years studying that remains unpublished, but we have some interesting um, results. And this is just an example of a very expensive simulation that only a modeling center like NASA Goddard or other um, international modeling centers could run that has you know, sufficient resolution to actually get at least the larger weather systems right. This can resolve you know, with some fidelity um, hurricanes, but it also has all of the inputs that you need to see how those can interact in a multi-scale climate forced by geological sources like wildfires and hurricane, um, and uh, volcanoes, as well as human sources of pollution. 
And so this kind of physics and chemistry uh, linking with a resolution high enough to get weather right um, at the scale of the globe is super exciting and super expensive. And so a lot of people are rightly looking for parameterization so that we don't have to resolve all of these scales. But one thing I wanna say is a lot of the meteorological community when we're trying to understand the physics of these severe events, um, we don't include aerosols, we don't include salt, uh, we don't include dust coming off of the Sahara. Um, and so there's really a gap still uh, between the disciplines of you know, the physical modeling of the small scale uh, storms and then the whole soup that the globe is inputting to the atmosphere that all matters for climate. And so I think that this space is really ripe for um, student projects and, and groundbreaking discoveries. And, you know, just, I, I think the more we erase this line between those working weather and those working in climate, um, you know, the better our, our regional and global climate predictions will be. So I'm sorry I, I left so little time for questions. I spoke way longer than I wanted to. I'm done and I would love to hear uh, your questions. Thanks very much. All right, thank you, Morgan, so much for that wonderful talk, giving us a broad overview of the of storms and climate. I think where we'll get started now that we're gonna open the Q&A and discussion section is with those questions in the uh, in the chat. So I don't know, Morgan, if you can see them. Otherwise, I can yes. read them out to you. But maybe we can repeat the question and then you can provide the answer if that's good. Uh, yes. So uh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. I do see the questions. Great. OK, um, so Divij asks, is it a good approximation to assume both land and water have the same temperature? That question was asked at 1209. So I'm trying to remember what I said. Because like that is a very context specific question and and some people will say yes and some people will say no so david if you're able to speak can you can you can you tell me for what scientific question you're asking about this approximation i'm not sure if the attendees can speak or not but oh oh um, maybe they can't okay bummer um yeah. sorry i think i think if they raise their hand we should be able oh, to allow okay. them to speak Oh, wonderful. I think. Okay. Okay. Let's see if that works. Two participants have raised hand. Great. Okay. Great. Let me find them now. They don't just bubble to the top. I think, I think they do. They right I think you top. should be able to, uh, to speak. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead. Good question. Uh, thanks. My question was in regards to when you were talking about uh, the heat engine and the Earth's surface being sort of the hot reservoir. So is it a good approximation to assume over there that the reservoir has sort of a uniform temperature? Um, uh, if you were doing a box model of the climate, you could get really far with assuming a single T in, but as soon as you are trying to assess the regional, um, for example, the potential intensity of tropical cyclones, then the the fact that the water temperature is heterogeneous heterogeneous um, and that these storms don't have access to sufficient uh, moisture over land really, really matters. So I would say on a global scale, if you want to do calculations of how maybe the climate heat engine is changing like a box model, it, it's just fine. But yeah, that that's a that's a scale uh, dependent problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. Let, did I stop sharing? Maybe I'll share my slides again. Oops. Okay, oh, right. So Carrie asks, did Milan at all take into account that H2O lofted into the middle stratosphere will destroy ozone there? I don't remember, but since that, uh, I don't remember. Carrie, I will send you this. Uh, actually, I don't need to send the citation. Let me just pull up the slide. Um, and share this slide so that we can we can look into it later. Zoom, share screen. Here we go. Yeah, I don't remember. My apologies, but here's the here's the citation. If anyone else knows, please put that in the put that in the chat. Other okay, questions? I'll look for it. Uh, a message. Sorry, what, Carrie? I said, great, I'll look for a, a, a message from you. 
Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll yeah, sure. I'll get you the answer. Yeah, happily. Uh, other questions? Uh, someone had the race, Henry, sorry, Stephen Schwartz, please um, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, just confirm that you're hearing me. Yes, we hear you. Thanks, okay. Stephen. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I was intrigued by your statement that, uh, having to do with the heat engine uh, analogy to a storm. And um, basically, energy comes in the bottom, goes out the top, that you don't get any work out of it. Um, and is the, say, the damage that's done to the surface um, just a, such a small fraction of the total heat budget that you don't count it? Um, because it seems like there's a lot of work involved in doing all this destruction at the surface. Yeah, I, well, all of that damage and, and that work definitely is part of uh, the dissipation of the, the kinetic energy that, that was produced due to this temperature difference. Um, so that's that's definitely allowed, and that that counts. That the role of dissipation allows us to be in a steady state with you know pretty constant uh, kinetic energy. W what I mean is, no work can be done external to the system. So the climate system is not pushing the moon. Um, there's really no I, I have no good conception of what a you know external work would be to the climate system. But that certainly what what you describe is is essential to these calculations and for us to get a steady state. That would all be wrapped up in the in the um, dissipation because just as we are, you know, drawing available potential energy from the climate system uh, and converting it to kinetic energy, there has to be a sink of kinetic energy, right? And so the dissipation is key, and it, and it often looks very destructive. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll take a chance to kind of prompt you, Morgan, if you don't mind. Sure, please. Um, maybe on the sort of in the in the realm of opportunities and and challenges. Um, I think you know we in the community have all seen you know, the the hurricane community come from a place where they couldn't, you know, really resolve the storms and the global models to a place where we have constraints from theory and the simulations in the global models are getting better and better. So in that vein, you know, what are the opportunities that you see looking forward for people with physics backgrounds to kind of get involved um, in, in better constraining this really important part of the climate systems, these smaller storms that can be so impactful? Better constraining the, the smaller storms. Yeah, I guess maybe in, in, the, in the vein of theory, you know, the Carnot cycle, like, what are the opportunities for moving forward for small scale storms, thunderstorms, supercells, um, where people can get involved to, you know, answer those questions. What do we expect for supercells, thunderstorms in the future? We don't, I think, have the answer, right? Yeah, yeah, that that's so difficult because they they can't possibly be resolved for, you know, <laughs> for many years, maybe not in my lifetime um, in climate simulation models. So ideally, we're looking for physics as, as simple and straightforward as that from Clausius Clapeyron, where we can say, some things about hurricanes with really strong confidence. Um, but yeah, it's 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 even harder for supercell thunderstorms. And so what people have done is look at, you know, potential storm days and warmer climates and say, okay, all of the large scale ingredients are there. Uh, but then it's still hard to measure something like instability. What will, will there be a trigger in 2100 to to realize the tornado potential of this much increased span of of you know tornado days that we see um, at low resolution. So I think that there, I, I want to say that there's room for theory, um, but I don't have specific ideas because like that's the challenge. Like we need people to come in and say, okay, here's a simple constraint that we can apply and 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 rely on. These really small scale storms are just really they just they're so sensitive to everything. People in the tornado community, you know, they'll change the microphysics a little bit, or they'll change the initial conditions just a tiny, tiny amount, like, you know, one meter per second, different gusts of air in the middle, and you you do or you don't get a tornado. And so, like, some of it seems hopeless, just some of it seems like so, uh, so reliant on like the, the, the chaos uh, inherent in the system that it's really, really hard for us to, to, um, to understand how that's going to manifest in a warmer climate. So I think that 
you know, we, we can learn a lot from these linear trends that I, I showed some plots of um, where we're, we're kind of just letting the data guide us. And then we can try to back out theory from the observations. But I think with these small scale storms, it's often it's hard to lead with theory. And that's because our models are dependent on everything at this scale. Uh, you know, microphysics, dust, pollution, the, the, the roughness of the surface. It's just like, you know, the time of day, it's just like, almost irreducibly complex. So uh, there's hope, but, but, you know, I would, I would rely more on observations, the smaller scale these storms get as a guide. Uh, David Battisti says, I would have expected the two simulations for tornadic potential to have the same pattern of change at the end of the century, but the higher emission scenarios show much greater amplitudes of change. Let me go to that plot. Wait, you say you expect them to have the same pattern of change. Okay, so you agree that you see that and they do, but the higher emission scenario, scenario shows much greater amplitudes of change. Yeah, I would have thought that the bottom panel there would have shown this, you know, brighter reds and brighter blues, but it seems like it's got kind of the same reds, but even lighter blues. <laughs> oh, even, okay, so less of it, so less of a decrease. So then I guess the, so the Great Plains isn't more spared by a higher emission scenario. In the, and I would expect the, the red in the Southeast to be even redder and cover more area. Do, is, is there a reason Well, why? yeah, I mean, so note, note the color bar. See the little arrow at the top? Uh, it could be redder. Oh yeah, it could be off scale. Yeah, so it saturates in this plot. So I actually don't know how much greater it is. So that would be, that would be a nice thing to see. Um, yeah, so so I, I can't say. I, I see what you mean though. Like the, there are fewer blues in the in the higher emission scenario. Maybe we should expect that because we expect um, you know, warmer surface temperatures and potentially more um instability. The wind shear argument, which you also need for supercell growth, is is a, a different beast that's harder to understand. Um but yeah, I guess the Great Plains are less off the hook uh in a really warm scenario. Yeah, I guess it, it, it kind of suggests that there's some, you know, maybe saturation in how the shear is going to change or, you know, that the path of these things is going to change. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, so right now, parts of the Gulf are undergoing a, a marine heat wave, which is kind of smashing records. And, um, and, and the Gulf is, is the primary source of water vapor at low levels that gets up into the plains in the Southeast U.S., and so I, I actually would have low confidence in these, the, you know, the details of these pattern changes if we don't even understand why the Gulf is the temperature it is right now, you know, trying to integrate that forward, uh, you know, 80 years may be a little bit dubious for, for under, understanding such small scale changes. Uh, one thing I want to mention um, for people who might find this really cool, I found it super cool when I learned it, is the Amazon plays a similar role as the Gulf of Mexico for tornadoes in South America. They have the Patagonia, uh, sorry, the Andes, the Andes mountain range, um, and then the, the water vapor source is actually the Amazon itself. It's really that moist that it can can dump uh, a bunch of low level water vapor pollard, and so they there's a little you know there's a tornado hotspot uh there as well so i think that's pretty cool any other questions or anything else no. oh divich um i was just wondering the 15 percent that you mentioned that um these storms would account for in the water vapor budget is that something that was missing previously or is that something that we consider is an excess of what we previously understood? That's a great question. And I think different people will give you different answers. And, um, you know, I have a different perspective, for example, as a person who studies deep convection compared to someone who has worked on a career in stratospheric water vapor. Um, I, it's my it's my impression that people like stratospheric scientists who who look at water vapor budgets feel really good about the closure of the budget in the tropics. Um, and, and they're less certain about those in mid-latitudes. And our primary instruments for measuring this um, include the microwave limb sounder. 
um, uh, which has pretty good but limited resolution. And in fact, it's it's um its range of of being accurate was exceeded by the plume uh, emitted by the Hunga Tonga Hunga volcano. And so I also I've looked at uh, I've looked at water vapor plumes in the lower stratosphere above simulated hurricanes, and they're actually really, really uh, substantial. And and so, but if I talk to a stratospheric person and, and I've done this, they'll say, oh no, the, the budget's closed. That can't possibly matter. So I would say, I would say that the 15% is likely an upper bound. That was just really a simple back of the envelope estimate by uh, Thierry Dauhut et al. I want to say 2015 or 2018. Um, if, if you just look at the injection rate over a storm and then you count up that many storms and, and their average lifetime. So that's like, that's pretty crude. I would say that there's a lot more work to to get that number uh, to to be more uh, confident. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I think we'll do a last call for questions. Raise your hand if there's any final burning questions. We'd be happy to unmute and entertain. I'll give it a minute or so. Um, thanks to all of those of you who've already asked questions for the great discussion, and thanks again to Morgan for her. Wonderful talk. As a reminder, all these talks are recorded and available on the website that I posted in the webinar chat. So you can always go back over them and um, look at the references or as Morgan said, reach out to the speakers if you have further questions. Doesn't yeah, please like write me. If anyone has a question, I would really love to, to continue this conversation. There's just a lot to do. Awesome. Well, it doesn't look like there's any pressing final questions. So we'll thank Morgan again for the wonderful talk and nice to see you all. I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good rest of your day.